All right, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us for this intimate little fireside chat. Um, I'm here with Lynn Alden, and we're gonna be talking about how money is changing, how the role of credit is changing, banking, and the state. Oh yeah, and energy too. So stick around. Um, I'm gonna kick us off by just saying, um, technology is accelerating everything, the pace of everything, um, including the pace of money. Um, so what does this acceleration of digital money uh, mean for, for the world? Sure, so I think whenever there is a technological change, there's always opposition groups to that change and wondering if it's safe, wondering if it's, if it's a good use of resources, and technology in the long run always wins out. And so I think we're seeing that happening now in the Bitcoin space where we found a way to automate and make far better uh, some of the ways we deal with money. And of course they're energy intensive, but a lot of people miss the, the upsides you get from that. And so basically for centuries, the two main roles of banking were basically credit provision and making money move faster. Making money move faster has been like this like multi-century problem that humans have faced. So whether it's trying to bring gold across the Silk Road and you're doing these like old paper bills of exchange from like a thousand years ago, they have bills of exchange written on papyrus, they have the Hawala system, it's like you know a thousand year old system of, of monetary channels of, of network effects, people you know kind of like transmitting value. And so this has been a problem that has been trying to be solved for a very long time. And as we got better communication systems, better transportation systems, it's, it's kind of sped that up. And so really what Bitcoin does is it just rapidly speeds up underlying settlement with a bare asset. And so one distinction I, I like to point out quite frequently is that in the, in the mid 1800s when we invented telecommunication systems and then specifically when we had undersea cables and connected all the continents, we sped up transactions so quickly, but we still had underlying settlement be very slow. And that created a huge arbitrage um, especially for banks and central banks to be able to kind of like that gap has been wider than it was for the centuries that preceded that. And really what the invention of Bitcoin is, is it speeds up settlement. The ability to actually settle final value with each other in depending on which layer you're using, seconds or, or minutes. Um, and so I think that's what is tr a, a big piece of what's transformative here. And it's something that I think people are too myopically focused on the energy usage and not focused on enough of, of how much this automation improves productivity. That's right, yeah. So um, that's a critical point. The closure of the gap between transaction speed and settlement speed is also a closure of a certain opportunity for arbitrage. But at the same time, we now have digital hard money that is globally accessible to virtually anyone. And so we have another arbitrage opportunity open up between harder monies and softer monies. Um, so how does that impact the role of credit and the relationship between credit and collateral going into the 21st century? So one thing we notice is that if you look at different types of monetary environments, um, you can kind of separate it into like weak money, strong money, or like medium money. And generally in, in weak money environments, let's say Argentina for example, you actually don't see a lot of debt and credit because lenders don't want to lend in that unit because they have no idea what they're going to get paid back uh, in terms of purchasing power e even in say a, a, a three year period. Um, on the other hand, if you have a very, very hard money environment, um, you, you don't see much credit either, um, but those are of course far more stable. You see lots of uh, growth, for example, throughout the 1800s, um, but you don't see a lot of frivolous uses of, of debt and credit because depositors, I mean, uh, borrowers are very cautious about how much they want to borrow in such a hard unit so that they're more likely to only use it for short duration, high impact types of functions. Um, whereas we're kind of in this phase now when you look at say developed market fiat currencies where they're actually kind of in this like weird sweet spot where they're, they have stability, but that brings about long-term instability. So by having this like gradually devaluing unit, both borrowers and lenders want to create credit in it. And so it, it functions for a while, but then you build up such a highly indebted system that that in itself creates its own instability. And so that's the environment that you actually build a maximum leverage. And so if you were to have a, a world where, say, Bitcoin is continuing to grow far larger, let's say 10, 20 years from now, and it's this global network of hard money, I don't think we'd see anywhere near the type, the, the size of credit. You'd still have some credit, but you wouldn't have like 
the long-term frivolous credit, right? So we can kind of separate two types. There's short-term high-impact credit, business expansion, you know, short-term liquidity, that type of thing still makes sense. But you wouldn't see the kind of debt that's like permanently on capital structures. So for example, Coca-Cola is a 100-year-old company, they still have debt. And the answer is why? And it's because really what they're doing is shorting the underlying currency. It's a cheaper part of their capital structure than equity, and that would not make sense in any sort of hard money environment. The same thing with 30-year mortgages or 30-year government bonds. Those types of longer permanent rolling debt as part of a capital structure does not make sense, but shorter term uh, credit still does. Yeah, so um, how do you think that impacts the role of banks? You know, if banks are the primary um, providers of credit today, and we're moving towards not, not so much a credit contraction maybe, but a slow down of the rate of growth of credit or, or debt. Um, how does that change the role of banks? So banks as a financial services company, I think still serve somewhat similar roles, but diminished. And so for example, you still have the credit of various types, but instead of a fractional reserve system, you'd have time linked deposits to those types of lending. Um, and then number two, it'd still be providing services. Like we see, for example, today there's collaborative custody. That's a financial service that some, some people can make use of. And there are other adjacent services. And I think a general theme is that they're still working with people to help them use money in, in potentially you know, more convenient, safer ways to varying degrees, um, but that their overall roles diminish because their arbitrage opportunities are, are diminished. Whereas on the other hand, I think, for example, uh, tying it back in, into the energy theme, I think the role of energy companies becomes larger in that type of world because energy is more linked to money in that, in that type of environment. So banks down, energy producers larger, more publicly relevant. Yeah, yeah. Um, energy is a, uh, such an important topic because you know we're at this civilizational crossroads right now where we're asking the question of um, can humanity survive the type of carbon intensive um, economies that we've been reliant on for, um, for the growth that we've seen over the past several centuries. Um, and you know, in response to that, we've had various movements emerge, whether that's ESG um, or even more extreme, the degrowth movement, which argues that um, huma humanity needs to use less energy over time. Um, and looking, looking at this from a, a historical and anthropological standpoint, we actually have plenty of data to show that um, the use of energy per capita is directly correlated with civilizational complexity um, and growth at every stage. Um, and so from my point of view, the degrowth movement is profoundly misguided in this way. Um, and the critiques of Bitcoin that you know, it uses too much energy, quote unquote, are profoundly misguided. We need to use more energy. The question, however, is how can we do that in a more uh, carbon neutral or less carbon intensive way? Um, and I wanted to ask you, you've spoken about this before, Lynn, like what are some of the market incentives that can um, create the conditions for shifting toward uh, a lower carbon energy production environment? So in general, I think that like a lot of things that become politicized, there's too much focus on one number, which in this case is, is carbon. I think when you, when you think about holistic use of energy, it's, it's about price, it's about how clean is it overall. So air particulates, water usage, things like that. There's multiple variables that defines whether or not an energy source is, is quote unquote clean or not, and in what way, and is its impact, you know, whatever environmental impacts it might have, is it happening at the source of production? or is it happening elsewhere? For example, mining materials and then not emitting pollutants at the source of, of actual on-site production. So there's all sorts of things about location and types of pollution that might be associated with energy. I, I think a general thing we see, um, and there's others that have been writing about this, I think quite um, elegantly, um, you know, like Ross Stevens in, in uh, you know, his, his letter in 2020 wrote about this, that basically what Bitcoin mining does is it allows humans to m more readily move towards sources of stranded energy rather than always having to bring energy to us. Mm -hmm. it, it helps us go out and find that. And so I think one of the things that it does is incentivize capital intensive processes for like long term energy things. Because, and, and Alex Glassney wrote about this too, which is that you have an environment, especially in developing countries, where they want to build an energy resource, let's say a hydroelectric dam, let's say other, some large, capital intensive thing and then you have a chicken and the egg problem where you know if you build up an energy source the question is 
are, are there going to be immediate buyers for all that energy that you've just spent you know, millions and millions of dollars building out? Uh, on the other hand, um, if there's not enough capital to want to build out those energy production, um, then there's not going to be usage of that electricity either. It's like a chicken and egg problem. And so one of the things that Bitcoin mining can do is, is, is help bootstrap that. It can incentivize it as a guaranteed buyer for, say, the first few years of production. And then as other uses of energy come in, they can outbid the Bitcoin miners because the Bitcoin miners need the cheapest electricity around. And yeah. so I, I think you start to see that kind of um, better economic incentive for it. And I think then the role becomes there's so many jurisdictions in the world and energy gets tied into government policies and things like that. We see, for example, windfall taxes on excessive energy production. We see um, uh, you know, things that try to incentivize one type of energy over another, and they might not be based on technology. They might be based on perception. Um, and so actually a question I'd have for you is like, what role do you think is gonna be a, this kind of transition um, as Bitcoin mining helps us incentivize different types of energy sources, especially in different countries, what role is the state gonna be involved? Is it just a matter of getting out of the way? Mm -hmm. Or are some countries gonna be able to promote this? Like we see, for example, the Kingdom of Bhutan mm. getting into to Bitcoin mining. Do you think this will be largely at the sovereign level? Do you think it'll be purely private market? Where do you see this kind of playing out? Yes, um, so the state has an important role to play um, insofar as it can get out of the way, first and foremost. So like, when we talk about energy subsidies, for example, like 70% of the world's energy subsidies are subsidies for fossil fuels. Um, and the problem is that once you have an entrenched role for the state in a particular um, economic vertical, it's really hard to remove the state from that or extricate the state from that without creating uh, very bad cascading effects. And so like, uh, for example, um, as we saw in Kazakhstan recently, when the state removed um, its, its oil and gas subsidies, you know, that was the, the match sort of that lit the, the revolution, the protests in the streets, so the Russian army had to be called in to pacify um, the revolt. And so um, when, when subsidies become sort of baked into the structure of an economic system, um, it becomes really insidious to try to remove them. Um, but nevertheless, subsidies do actually stand in the way, in my view, of, of progress, of diversifying our, our energy mix, so to speak. Another huge problem, um, which we've seen become a political issue in the United States, is permitting reform. Um, it's really hard um, for many U.S. states to set up uh, cleaner forms of energy production and generation because uh, landowners are vociferously opposed to it, um, competitive energy producers uh, sponsor legislation um, and run ad campaigns to basically kill any new ener energy generation um, initiatives. And so there's, there's a kind of gridlock. Um, so there are, there are obstacles that need to be removed from, from a governance uh, level. Ultimately, the, um, the market incentives are towards cheaper and cheaper sources of energy for everyone. Bitcoin mining is uniquely able to capitalize on it because it is such a mobile proposition. You can set up Bitcoin mines anywhere. It's not location dependent, um, particularly. Um, so in some ways, Bitcoin mining is kind of the canary in the coal mine um, but ultimately, I think the goal should be toward um, accelerating the, the competitive um, momentum toward cheaper and cleaner sources of energy. I think that, Thank you. I think like a really big thing that we're seeing is that there's just not a lot of understanding out there. Yeah. So for example, even in Texas, even in, in different places you think would embrace it quicker, you still find political opposition to it. Yeah. And when you dive in, and I, I've talked to a number of, of miners about this, for example, you actually see it, competitors um, trying to muddle the narrative. Yep. So for example, on one hand, you have Bitcoin miners pointing out, hey, you know, we're highly mobile, highly flexible um, consumers of electricity. Yep. We can make use of it. Like, if you're producing too much variable sources, we can absorb some of that. If you have these always on sources like nuclear power or hydropower and you're not using all of it, you're not monetizing it properly, we can come in and, and, and soak up the rest of it. So on that hand, you have those types of arguments. But on the other hand, you have 
competitors, right? So you have, for example, you can have companies that um, operate battery farms mm -hmm. or companies that operate uh, natural gas peaking plants. They want to be the demand response. And so one thing that they can do is they can come in and say, you know, actually, um, Bitcoin mining is bad for X, Y, Z, and we're going to donate to politicians and try to put our solution there instead if they can't compete with Bitcoin miners directly. And I think that's something that we're seeing in a number of locations, including Texas. And it'd be interesting to see which jurisdictions are able to kind of bypass um, yeah. that type of political opposition. Because yep. in the long arc of time, you would think that the, the most technological solutions should win out mm -hmm. from market forces. But then it becomes a question of how long does it take for certain entrenched interests to slowly get kind of chipped away. And I think that, you know, whether you look at, um, I, I think overall one of the big problems is, is that people just don't understand it. Yeah. You know, Bitcoin is enough, like, we all even saw debates, like the, the, the debate just happened before us, right? That's, all, that's a technical problem. Right. And if you look at, say, macro circles, it's like mostly completely off their radar. Same thing happens with energy, right? When yeah. you see the energy talking points that are out there in terms of like that New York Times piece, or you see it in, in politics, it's such a low surface understanding of how both Bitcoin works and how electricity works. And that like gap is just completely unaddressed. Yep. And I think that there's so much more work to do about educating people. One is about how electricity is consumed and produced and then how Bitcoin uses energy because mm -hmm. when people actually see the numbers, like I've generally found that when you actually talk to politicians, you actually talk to um, policymakers, you actually kind of walk them through step by step how this works. In private, they tend to get it. Mm -hmm. um, even in public, when they're limited to sound bites and they're limited to themes and things like that, it's very easy to gloss over the details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. Um, and so, you know, wh what is the state actually good for? Um, it, you know, we talked about the importance of deregulation, of getting the state out of the way, not putting its, its thumb on the scale um, it, with energy markets. But you know, one of the value propositions I would say of the state is that it can be a vehicle for education. Um, so you know, when we talk about um, investing in America's energy future, for example, um, one of the key elements of that is you know, beginning with our public education system. Uh, incentivizing the highest quality possible education worldwide. Um, I think we've, we've given up on the competitiveness of our education system. Um, and that is a major problem. Like there, there are school districts around the country that are removing higher level STEM courses from public school curricula, ostensibly in the name of equity. Um, but I would suggest that you don't achieve equity by lowering your standards. Um, instead, Every American child deserves the opportunity to be excellent. Um, and so deregulation, education, and immigration, these are the three pillars. Immigration is the third. We have cut off the funnel valve, uh, the talent funnel, um, into the United States. There are so many hoops um, that immigrants have to jump through. Um, the smartest people in the world who cannot remain in this country if they don't have an employer um, sponsoring them. You know, people who, like, 75% of the graduate students in the United States are foreign. Um, we're training these people to be the best in the world at what they do, and then we're kicking them out. Um, we need talent in this country. We need to nurture it locally, and we need to bring it in and incentivize it. Your I think one. <laughs> I think one way to kind of like as we as we wrap this up over the next few minutes is to, what are like the highest impact things to help people understand these types of problems more? So I think that one thing, both education and and kind of like the political like theater that happens is trained on, is really focused on sound bites and is focused on a myopic view and not like that second and third order effects. So for example, they look at Bitcoin and they say it consumes X amount of energy. And it's almost like funny because, because Bitcoin's energy usage is among the most transparent, it's easy to quantify and then use statistics to make it look bad or look good. So for example, it's easy to say Bitcoin uses more energy than Argentina, um, which sounds catastrophic, but you can also say Bitcoin uses 0.1% of global energy, which sounds like trivial. Right. You can also say Bitcoin is kind of competing with like the zinc industry in terms of how much energy they use. 
people are not concerned about zinc mining's energy usage, <laughs> right? If you compare it to any large industry, it, it's not, it's nowhere near as big as the aluminum industry, for example, in terms yeah. of energy usage. And so you have this thing where I, part of why there's so much opposition, I think, to Bitcoin's energy usage is that lack of education and the ability to kind of quantify something. And then to be able to say, not only how much energy is it using, but what is it replacing? Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of different studies, and maybe they're even, you could even cut them in half and say, even if the numbers are different, we don't know. So for example, ARC, you know, they, they did an open, like they, they open sourced some of their research and they said, we even analyzed the banking system, and I forget the exact number, but it uses something like 20 times as much energy as the Bitcoin network if you say, okay, all these office buildings, all these people working on things that could be automated, all these things like that, and it's actually a very large energy usage. And yeah. even if that's, even if they're off by half, even if it's only half as much energy as they say, it's still this very kind of inefficient use of resources. And not enough people say, if we added this, what are we subtracting from? Mm -hmm. The same thing I think is, the same thing I think is true for like tractors. You know, when tractors came out, if, if people said, well, that uses hydrocarbons, and it's like, well, you're also saving like 10 humans for every one human now to do the work, and you free up those other nine humans to go up and make all sorts of other products and services, and you have that radically more productivity thing. So I don't know what the, what the best way to do is to kind of make that increasingly clear to people, but I think it's just chipping away one at a time and say, one, how to actually quantify it correctly, and then two, what is it replacing? What is it competing with? what types of energy is being replaced. That's exactly right. Um, efficiencies um, are the way that a society advances. Um, and so going back to this earlier uh, discussion of the need to actually grow the total amount of energy that we are using um, as a civilization, you know, every, every historical empire, historical civilization um, reaches a point of like maximum resource consumption um, and then if it can no longer feed um, its resource needs, it begins to fall into decline. Um, and there are three ways that societies have typically solved that problem. Um, one has been through the accumulation of debt, which we've already seen. Debt, you can think of debt as a form of trapped, uh, or of um, ener energy. Um, it's just a credit that is used um, in the absence of hard collateral. Um, but as that debt ramps up and ramps up, eventually it begins to be called due. Um, and if the society as a whole is too leveraged, um, then what happens, what tends to happen is either the sovereign declares a debt jubilee and cancels debts, or there's a revolution, or there is some kind of war or imperial expansion to feed the resource base. Um, and I would suggest that right now, um, we're at that crossroads. So Bitcoin mining can serve as a kind of beacon as to how to generate more surplus, both hard collateral um, and in terms of fiat money, both at the sovereign level and at the individual level. Yeah. All right. So we have about 30 seconds left. So I think the final point, I think I said this on Twitter once. So I was like, the first rule of, of you know, trying to manage a developed country is don't have an energy shortage. Yeah. And the second rule of running a developed country is don't have an energy shortage. Um, <laughs> and when I think of like long-term scenarios that turn out good or bad, the darkest ones always involve not having enough energy. Right. And so I think that the, the, the stress of energy security couldn't be more something we need to focus on and stress. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Welcome back to Bitcoin 2023 here in Miami. This is the Bitcoin Magazine live desk brought to you by Marathon. We just heard what might be the narrative around the separation of money and state. We heard all kinds of interesting things about how Bitcoin can align and incentivize energy systems around the world to create a golden age of energy abundance. That's what I heard anyway. So. Josh, uh, you had some pretty interesting points uh, when we were off camera. Yeah. Let me hear them. Uh, well, I think my takeaway from that talk was generally that energy is directly correlated with human flourishing. So, I mean, that is a primary thing we need to think about. And what, what comes to mind for me when I think about that is we recently spoke to Eric Hersman. Or that episode will be out on Saturday, actually. He was telling us all about Gridless and what they're doing in Africa and how they're actually able to 
bolster these grids in rural Africa that wouldn't be able to have the energy generally at all. And they're able to pay these things off in about a seven year period of time, which is normally would take 20 to 30 years. And this is only because Bitcoin mining has enabled them to, uh, to create the ability to do this. Otherwise, it couldn't happen. There's just no money there to actually create these grids. And, and it, for those of you out there who are unaware, Gridless is a Bitcoin mining project that is actually financing the development and, and deployment of a small hydroelectric dam in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me that economic relationship, what they talked about, is uh, more or less an anchor tenant in a real estate project. So you build a strip mall, you need a grocery store, for example. And, someone who is operating professionally in the mining space, does that check out to you, that kind of logic of financing large projects and, and using the miner as a reason for which you would build more capacity into the grid? Precisely. I mean, it's, as far as what Gridless is doing, it's absolutely incredible. And the point that it makes in the market is that we use energy, yes, but we're not solving a conceptual problem with Bitcoin. We're solving an engineering problem with Bitcoin. And because the engineering is simple and the incentives look a certain way, and when you pay that electrical bill, it goes to a utility, a utility that then has to work on the genera generation, transmission, and delivery of that power, you're now having a conversation not about the sort of esoteric, how is Bitcoin going to save the world? You're having extremely practical conversations about how the production, transmission, and com uh, delivery of that final electrical uh, electron stabilizes communities, especially small ones, and in the sense of large ones, provides stability to the grid, whether it's you know, baseload plants using uh, Bitcoin mining as a way to actually go in and have sort of peaker plant operations. So that would be, you have to have stable power. Without stable power, we're not having this conference. I'm not communicating to you over the internet. If you get rid of that, you, you, you go back to the Stone Age. What Bitcoin allows you to do is it lets you run larger production, larger baseload, and have that baked in capacity where you have the anchor tenant. There's always somebody buying, there's always somebody uh, taking it, and there's somebody who will turn it off under the right contractual agreement, and that's what keeps divide, uh, society stable. You want to grow the pie. You don't want to go in and say, oh, let's slice off this sliver of the pie. The name of the game is that energy is human flourishing. And, and you were mentioning the, the stability of the energy network, the engineering issues, but of course the uh, balancing act there is the stability of the money. And mm -hmm. money stability, of course, has a role in all of this. So Ben, you were talking about that money stability. Yeah, I, so earlier in the talk they were talking about debt. And, and Lynn had this very interesting point that um, there's kind of this societal economic bell curve that results depending on the softness or hardness of one's money as it relates to how much credit is being utilized. If your money is very soft, then nobody wants to lend because they don't know the value of what they're going to get paid back. But if your money is very, very hard, then people scrutinize what they take debt for because it, it is going to be hard to pay back. And so they want to be sure they're investing it in a venture that makes sense. But when you're in the middle, when it's kind of mushy, it's still kind of working, then everybody just takes out debt for everything. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Everybody, it, Western nations are built atop debt and, and it's consumer debt, it's, it's corporate debt, it's everything. And so extremely soft or hard money results in a hyper awareness of the consequences of where you place your capital. And when you get in that middle mushy zone, you get complacency. Complacency equals a drop in one's economic IQ.